Somewhere in my college career, the battle shifted for me. The depression entered my story. It took a while to like actually name it as symptomatic and something that needed care. And so I got an antidepressants and saw a counselor. You actually aren't supposed to drink when you're in antidepressants, but um, that didn't stop me. The story was cloudy and murky, and the verdict I think I unpacked over time was that I am a depressed person. It doesn't always feel to me like the kind of battle I think I expected as a kid of like active motion. Like sometimes I just, I need to go for a bike ride because I can't do anything else. And I feel like very, I'm almost claustrophobic. It is who I am, it's what my battle is going to be, but it's not really a battle, it's more of a reality. Like you can't fight your reality. I want to ask you if you did one of the exercises that we recommended earlier in the series uh, connected to session one about naming the movies that you love, your favorite movies, your favorite stories, and then thinking about why is it that I love, you know, Star Wars or Gladiator or the Avengers, you know, your favorite films? Why is that? Because if you look back into those stories, they're actually telling you something really important about your heart, the way you're wired, what you're designed for. And there's something that that hero has that your heart is longing to have or to be or to become. There's always a battle and there's always adventure and there's always some beauty, right? There's those elements in there. But what I wanna ask is this, why does every movie have some kind of villain? Right, you've got Longshanks and Braveheart, and you've got the Dark Lord Sauron in the Lord of the Rings, and you've got Commodus, right? Or you've got you know all the evil figures in the superhero movies. Why? Why does every story have a villain? Because yours does, and most of you are not living like it. So let's look at First Peter chapter five, verses eight and nine. This is a very critical sort of worldview orientation here. Peter says, be alert. Heads up. Hello, <whistles> yoo-hoo. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, knowing that your brothers all throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. This is fascinating. Peter is assuming, God is assuming, something very essential about your life, that you live in a world at war. And this is where most men actually get taken out. They don't like that part of the story. They don't want that to be true. They just want to be like the hobbits in the Shire. They just want life to be good, and it's about our joy, and it's about our happiness, and it's us and our friends and our family and God trying to make it work. But guys, heads up, you were born into a world at war. Two million children are trafficked every year into the sex trade. One out of every two marriages ends in divorce. The World Health Organization just announced that depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide. I mean, what do you do with this mess around us? There's heartache, there's horror, there's tragedy. You have an enemy. And your enemy is looking to steal from you. And all those wounds that you've taken in your life, he didn't arrange for all of them, but what he does is he comes in and he puts his spin into them. He puts his message on them. Every man has a story, as we've been talking about in this series, and the story of your life is the story of the long orchestrated assault against your heart by your enemy who fears you. He fears who you could be if you become a wholehearted man 
living in a deep connection with God. You become dangerous, you become powerful. And so he strikes early and he strikes hard and we lose heart. When I was a boy, everything was a medium for some battle. The Blue Angels on bikes, it was green beret through the neighborhood. We're literally chewing guns out of the graham crackers our mom is giving us for breakfast. The battle just made total sense. I'm wearing a cape and sunglasses and a bunny hat, but I'm, I'm like two years old. I mean, here we are, pilot helmets, the knight costumes. I think those are actually broom handles. Every Christmas or birthday, somebody was asking for a new Lego or a new lightsaber or a new blaster of some kind. Like we just wanted more things to continue that world and, and build that world. This is who I am. And I'm just sort of waiting to be able to use the force. I would sit there and be like, any second now, <laughs> This remote's gonna come flying in my hand. It's gonna be amazing. I'm gonna be the first one. And so you can imagine the disappointment when it never happened. 10, 11, 12, 13, like, where is the battle? When does it actually happen? The movies that we love where there's orcs charging and something clear, something black and white, that would be so much simpler than the life I seem to experience. And real life, just felt very normal and felt very underwhelming. Since becoming a father, like, stakes have gotten raised. And when I make the agreement of like, whatever I do won't be enough, or however much we have won't be enough, or our finances aren't enough, I get taken out of the moment. I'm not present when I get home. I'm stressed, I'm distracted, and it does feel like no matter how much I make, it will never be enough. Because whatever additional, whatever yearly little bump, whatever Christmas bonus comes in, it's gone and before it touches the ground. There isn't enough money. Like, this is, just, this is just what it is. And so it feels like no amount of mental or internal posturing could actually change the scenario with that one. I wish that I could feel not six when things feel difficult. I think he comes in with his lightsaber to save the day. And I find myself just in this spiral of, yeah, no, it is all up to you. You're a bad dad because you can't X. It's never gonna be enough. You can hear in Sam's story, the heart of the boy that wanted to be the Jedi. You know, we all had that young, innocent place that wanted to be the hero, that was ready for some kind of mission, right? Some kind of challenge. And then you hear how life begins to erode that conviction and take away those hopes and dreams. And then, then the battle gets very real. I hope what you heard in there was the primary battle was for his heart, right? That's the first battle, because if we lose heart, everything else begins to collapse around us. Our relationships, our mission, our work, our joy, friendship, right? I said in, in session one, if you lose heart, you lose everything. The enemy knows that. So in John chapter 10, verse 10, famous for many people, right? Jesus says, the thief comes, to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it fully, have it to the full. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, my intentions towards you are really good. I didn't give you that boyhood heart just to torment you and taunt you and then stick you in a job you hate for the rest of your life. I do want life for you, but be sober about your situation, you have an enemy. And he's very real, and he comes to steal 
and kill and destroy. So if Jesus assumes something about our life, that the enemy can steal, kill, and destroy, it's something that we probably ought to assume too. But most men don't. This is where most men get taken out. We feel betrayed by God. I know I do, right? When things start going sideways and the disappointment strikes and there isn't enough money at the end of the month or your friends walk away, your marriage collapses, the first thing we do is, come on, God. Like we feel betrayed by God. And this is where you can see the real heart of evil in the world. You see, we need to know that our Father loves us and that He is with us and initiating us in our journey, right? We need to know our Father's heart toward us is good. But most of us learned pretty terrible things about God as Father from our own fathers or for the men in our world. You see, and that's how He gets in to sow doubts. And then the battle strikes and the wounds come and the attack happens and we feel betrayed. And Jesus was saying, don't feel betrayed. I want life for you. Peter's saying, look, your brothers all throughout the world are undergoing the exact same thing. This isn't unique to you, but you do need to, heads up, resist him firm in the faith. We do need to deal with this. And what Sam was trying to illustrate in his story was the debilitating power of what we call agreements. Okay, so what happens is the enemy comes in with a message, right? He comes in with a spin. You know, you walk in the door and your wife's angry at you and he's just there in a minute to say, see, see, she doesn't really love you, right? You don't have what it takes here. You are failing or you're failing as a dad or, you know, you blow something at work. Something goes bad, a presentation, a project, and the enemy's there in a minute to say, you are out the door. He comes in putting his interpretation on the story of our life. And what he's looking for from us is what we call an agreement. We go with it, we swallow it, we go, yeah, that's totally true. That's, she doesn't love me. I'm almost out of here, right? My friends don't care. He's trying to get us to agree with his lies, agree with his interpretation of the story, in, including towards God. Right? Your father's not here. God's abandoned you. And it's awful when we agree. As Sam was saying, when he came under the agreement, it, it was debilitating. Right? You got no hope. There, where's the exit? Where's the breakthrough once we're under that? So it's so critical to identify this. You live in a world at war. You have an enemy. And he's coming in trying to get you to make agreements with his interpretation. So... My story, you heard that I grew up in an alcoholic home and I became a pretty wild kid. I actually had a police record and at one point when I was arrested, I was a minor and they had to get one of my parents to come down. They couldn't find my mom because she had gone back to work. Somehow they tracked down my dad and he came down to the police station and picked me up and took me home. And I'm waiting for the moment. I'm waiting for the fatherly intervention. I'm waiting for the pal, what's going on? What's all this about? We love you. What are you doing? Nothing. Not even a word. He was literally silent the entire time. And that day, I made a very deep agreement, something that the enemy brought in through my wound. And the agreement was, I'm on my own. I'm on my own. Don't ever trust anyone. And poor Stacy, my wife, she lived with a man making that agreement years into our marriage. I was very guarded, very protected, because in the core of my being, I've still got that agreement. Don't ever trust anybody. You are on your own. Do you know what your agreements are? I mean, sometimes they come out of your mouth. Like, what do you say to yourself when you really screw something up? What do you say when somebody else disappoints you? Right? When the project goes down the tubes or you don't get invited on the ski trip, like what do you say? It's so critical to identify our agreements and then go back to your wounds. What were the messages of your wounds? What came through your specific story, the way the wounding came in? There was a message there. What are the agreements that you have made with those messages? Because the fight for our heart the recovery of our heart begins right here, 
Live fire warrior training. God is training warriors, and there's only one way to really get that done, and that's to put us in a real fight. So we are here in the action, and I wish we could all kind of go back to training camp and get this sorted out and get everything, you know, set in place, and then we march into the battles that we face, but it's right here, it's right now in real life. Are you able to discern the difference between the reality of the circumstance that that you're experiencing versus the message and the interpretation that is coming to try to get you to make new agreements? It took me years. Like I was on, I was on antidepressants for several years and, and mercy for people that need to use them. Like it's actually, it's a cast for your mind. The revelation came when I, I named, I wasn't a depressed person. I was someone who battled depression. And it, it can feel like semantics but it actually is so much more, like it's actually much more hopeful. It isn't semantics, it's a, it was a paradigm shift for me, right? Because if I'm someone who battles it, then it's not my identity, then it's not my verdict, then it's not the water I'm swimming in. It's actually something I can choose away from or towards. And that marks the moment where instead of giving in to this agreement, this reality that I felt like was true, I actually got to keep it at arm's length and engage it that way. Identifying the agreements, some of them are historic that we've been making for a long time. Some are coming at us right now, this week, and breaking them. And by breaking the agreement, as you heard in Sam's story, he had to differentiate, I am not a depressed person. I battle depression. I am not an addict. I battle with this particular addiction, right? I am not a failure though I blew it on that project. We begin to identify the agreements and, and literally out loud, we say, I reject that. I am not a failure. I am not an idiot. I am not alone. And my father has not abandoned me. The power of breaking agreements. <gasps> I mean, seriously, it's like coming up for air. Like you've just been held down underwater and you come up in the clarity and then you're able to move in your story with just like some more orientation, okay? So Psalm 51, 6, you desire truth in the inmost being. The Hebrew there for inmost being means the shut place. Isn't that interesting? Or the locked place. These things get in there and they get locked down. And what we want to do is surface them, name them, and reject them. Literally break agreements with these lies so that our heart can breathe, so that we can come up for air, and so that we can walk with God. The recovery of the warrior heart is absolutely essential, brothers. Like, this is so important because everything else in life, we want the love, the beauty, the friendship, the dreams, the mission, it really waits on this, right? Because it's gonna take the warrior in you to walk into the rest of that. begun to practice breaking the agreement that it's never going to be enough and it changes everything. Last year was the 10th year anniversary of not needing antidepressants. I have had seasons of low but they don't affect me the same way and I've had emotion return and everything else plays out from it. The kind of dad I'm going to be, the kind of husband I'm going to be, the kind of friend I'm going to be, the kind of man I'm going to be for myself. I get to actually walk through with hope. And I get to actually engage my kids, actually engage my family, actually engage my work. I feel the tension bleed from my shoulders. 
Sometimes it's just choosing to face a certain direction. Even if we can't do anything else at this moment, that's going to be our act of battle. It isn't semantics. It is a battle. I get to choose how I want to respond. Thank you.